Okay, so I am actually going to be talking about some of the sort of global, or at least European, um, use of uh, data standards and the importance of data standards in a practical uh, way. Um, I'm going to be talking, I'll come out from behind the, the pillar, I think it's better. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, a European research infrastructure called Ariadne and say a little bit about how work that we and a number of other uh, partners, uh, some of whom are here, done within Ariadne in the application of the practical application of those data standards. So, just to give you a bit of background, if you're not familiar with, with Ariadne, um, it's a relatively large uh, consortium of European partners concerned with bringing together a lot of the, the otherwise what would be dangerously siloed. Uh, national uh, data archives, such as uh, the ADS in, in the UK, but others that are emerging uh, elsewhere in the world, um, really with the underlying premise that if you're doing archaeological research, your research questions, or at least the grand challenges in archaeological research, are rarely constrained by modern political boundaries, and therefore we need to be able to bring together data sets. And for archaeology, research infrastructure is often about being able to access data in, a, in an open access way. Um, and so Ariadne is, a, is about ways in which um, we can do that. Um, the first phase of Ariadne uh, ended in 2017. Uh, it was a European Commission funded project coordinated by uh, Franco Nicolucci, uh, uh, a ADS acted as deputy uh, coordinators. But I'm going to say a little bit more as well about how we're now taking it forwards, both within the context of um, an, uh, a new European infrastructure that's being developed for heritage science, which the digital component is an important element. That's uh, ERIS, European Research Infrastructure for Heritage uh, Science. And within that, what's known as the DigiLab uh, component of, of ERIS, which is in effect Ariadne, and will be what we're calling Ariadne Plus now, which I'll say more about at the, later in the talk. But in Ariadne, this was the uh, initial consortium, 24 partners in, in 18 countries. Um, and the end going back actually to a principle that some people in this room will remember a very early CAA paper by Henrik Jarl Hansen, the Danish uh, National Heritage Agency, Cultural Agency, uh, where he created this all very analog uh, diagram of, I don't know why he chose uh, octopuses, but octopuses joining up uh, across Europe to represent these separate uh, repositories working together. And really that's uh, what we've been trying to uh, achieve now that the technology is much more uh, able to, to do that. So just this, this is sort of an example, it's not sort of complete or, uh, by any means of the sorts of data sets brought together uh, as a result of the, this first phase of Ariadne, but it shows a rather sort of disparate, rather uh, not necessarily data recorded, recorded according to the same data standards or the same metadata and certainly not the same languages uh, across these European repositories. So it's how we uh, try and pull them together that I'm going to be talking about. So how do we achieve interoperability at a European level? It's hard enough just at a, at a national uh, level. Well, underpinning it, and I promised Steve Stead, who's, who's upstairs, that I'd mentioned the C.CRM, uh, but the C.CRM is, is the fundamental uh, semantic glue that holds this together. And so the Ariadne data model is mapped to C.CRM. We're going to be making far more use of it in the next phase of Ariadne, where uh, we're bringing together many different types of, of data. Currently, it's a rather the, the Ariadne metadata store is a rather flat file uh, data structure at the moment. Um, and you may be aware that there have been various extensions of, of, of CRM, both for below ground and above ground archaeology for inference and for um, archaeological sciences as, as well. Um, so it's a condition of, of supplying data to uh, Ariadne that partners have to map their data to certain uh, standards. 
uh, to, and um, show how they conform to the Ariadne data model. Um, and we've basically boiled it down to the, the golden trio of, of, of what, when, and where, uh, which can be used to uh, narrow down large numbers of data sets as a tool for resource discovery to find the data sets that you're interested in. And we've done three sorts of, of, of mappings, or rather individual partners have, have, have done three sorts of, of mappings. Um, for one, we decided to um, map to the Getty AAT. Uh, for where, we use the WGS84 spatial data standard. And for when, partners have to recall their use of uh, periods in, in periodo. So I'll say a little bit more about each of those as the talk goes on. Now, first of all, I wanted to show you this diagram, which is a rather sort of complicated one, but it shows the overall vision and framework for achieving Ariadne, uh, interoperability in Ariadne. These are the, is the sort of top level architecture, the infrastructure and integrated services uh, with a portal for cross search, a registry where all the, the metadata is, is harvested because we're retaining the principle we're only harvesting metadata. So you drill down to primary records in the countries where they are best kept. We're not trying to create one uh, massive mega database of everything. The data needs to be stored and preserved by the curators uh, of it. Um, we're also uh, very linked data compliant, so that we're not just creating yet another silo. We can link outwards uh, from Ariane to other discipline type uh, uh, things to place name gazetteers and, and so forth. Um, and the data suppliers for Ariadne come from a variety of different types of projects which all vary according to sort of national politics and local uh, archaeological infrastructures. Some of them uh, data centres such as ourselves in the UK, but uh, Edna in, in the Netherlands and uh, SND in Sweden. Um, but then also what we'd regard more as, as uh, uh, specific uh, repositories of more specialised functions, such as Arachne in Germany and Fasti on, online for the Mediterranean. Um, and then also, at a lower level, then institutional repositories and data centres are providing data via those, uh, and individual research projects are generally feeding into those, some uh, that way. So it's a sort of tiered organisation that hopefully accommodates the different situations in different countries. So um, if you've not been to the area of need portal, I'd recommend you have a look at it. It's quite a powerful uh, search uh, tool and as well as the sort of Google type, type and hope type of approach, you can quite quickly go into a much more structured search, a fast browse type search, according to these three facets of where, when, and what. Uh, so, going for the sort of type and hope approach, you can start to type in something that you might be interested in, and then there's sort of automatic expansion according to the known terms in the system. So I've I'm taking a rather simplistic example, but I'm interested in brooches, which I actually quite sad I happen to, to be interested in brooches. Uh, but um, so it's suggesting some terms drawn from thesauri uh, that are within the Ariadne database. And these are actually concepts that are held in the Getty AAT. Now, the reason for choosing Getty, we had a long debate uh, about this amongst uh, partners. Getty was somehow seen as a neutral system rather than adopting any particular national uh, standard. It's obviously got much larger traction as well beyond uh, archaeology. Um, and what we wanted to avoid was ha having to map every single national vocabulary to every other. So the approach that Dr. Dunn, it was Doug Tutto and Kerry Bynum, the University of South Wales, did a lot of uh, this work was to say what we'll do is map everyone's terms to a common core spine using the, the Getty and that then achieved interoperability and it's extensible because we can add other partners on as we go through time because they just need to map once to the Getty and they're immediately then interoperable with every other data set that's in, in our area. Obviously 
it's only as good as the data you put in and the level of granularity of the mapping. I well appreciate that often we're dealing with concepts rather than things and that creates its own problems, but it still works relatively uh, well. Uh, so if we take an example of my search that have expanded as, as ring brooches, this is just, I chose this one to, Ariadne at the moment doesn't have a lot of individual artifacts in there, it's mainly at the site and monument type database, so I'm not getting many results uh, back, but it's producing five uh, data sets that, that in the metadata, it's got ring brooches, so this is one drawn from the, the UK, a metadata that's held by ADS, you can see that the, the metadata is being tagged uh, there, there's the ring brooches coming up there and listed as subject terms. It's suggesting other uh, uh, sites in the same area, but thematically uh, similar data sets as well. And then I can also then, from that metadata, drill down to the primary uh, resource. So this is then taking me straight to the ADS uh, library and that specific unpublished fieldwork report with the DOI there and available for, uh, for download. And there, from ADS, is the, the same metadata. So we're not, we're just harvesting that rather than typing it all, all, all in again. It's, it's following the principle uh, that Fish and other organisations have, have long followed that the, the best way to do, to expose our data is through multiple shop windows, in fact. Because people, different researchers with different needs will go to different portals. We're not just trying to create one mega portal. And, and Europeana often harvests some of the same metadata, but again for a different audience, one that's more, more public facing. Um, the multilingual support is, is built in really by our use of the Getty because if you link to the, to the Getty definition of the term, there's the, the scope note for it, the URI uh, drawn from the Getty and its condition that of any of these terms they must have URI so that it's sustainable, and then it pulls up uh, the uh, translations of those terms, in this case in, available in Spanish and, and, and Dutch, and uh, also the mapping to annular brooch there. Um, this is a tool that Devin Kerry developed, I think Kerry's going to be probably talking more about it tomorrow, uh, a session, really useful tool to map from one vocabulary to another online tool that you could type in, uh, particular to choose what vocabulary it's, it's drawn from, in this case the fish, uh, archaeological objects, thesaurus, uh, and then mapping that to Getty AAT terms and allowing you to select your preferred mapping. We did it for, uh, well, placement students in ADS actually did it with some support from uh, archaeological specialists, mainly me, uh, but she did it in a couple of weeks for, uh, for all the uh, uh, TMT and, and, and FISH uh, archaeological objects terms as, as well. Uh, so not not particularly onerous, um, and yeah. So here's another example of a of a, a record, quite a slim one. It's not even got a title, but it's a, a bronze annular brooch of the Saxon period, with tagged with with ring brooch uh, uh, there. Um, I won't dwell on on this, um, but it, it shows the underlying data structure. And the uh, the point I did want to make is that we're not deleting native subjects, obviously they're held uh, within the Ariandi database as, as well. What we're creating is, uh, as well as the native provided term, a, a mapped term as well as an additional field in the, in the database. And then this is a, so a derived subject, and then this feeds into uh, Elasticsearch, which provides the sort of faster browsing uh, uh, facilities. So that was what, uh, when is, as generally in archaeology, as long as you can agree on a spatial data standard, which is more straightforward, archaeological data used as a spatial component and achieving interoperability over space is much easier. You can just look at open uh, map layers. Uh, so again, we harvested the, the spatial data. Our German colleagues at the DAI de developed a, an interface with this sort of heat map that allowed you to, to drill down into particular areas that you're interested in, in this case, coming down to 55 resources in part of the, of the Netherlands where our, our Dutch colleagues provided data. And then the when, um, when, when is, is, is always quite an interesting uh, concept in archaeology. 
and how you agree on periods. And what we did is we didn't force people to agree on periods. We allowed them to disagree, but to define how they disagree. And this is where periodo came in. If you're not familiar with it, it's an um, American project funded by the NEH in the States, which has created uh, a data sets for the definitions for period terms. So it's a condition of taking part in Ariadne that you, if you were using the term I know, Iron Age, you had to define how you use that term, what, what your start and end date was. And so we have lots of different Iron Ages defined in Ariadne, as you would expect, because it's spatially dependent. The Iron Age in, in, in England even isn't the same as the Iron Age in Scotland. Uh, and as you go across Europe, it expands further beyond that. So you just need to define what you mean by Iron Age. Then you have a start and end date, which then allowed us to do this diagram. This is the sort of data in Ariadne, sort of, as you can see, quite a peak uh, for in the sort of post-medieval, uh, medieval, post-medieval at, at the moment, that you can select a particular, uh, uh, from if the sort of period I'm interested in, 882 to 999, so you can drill down, select those records and pull them up. And what I've done is selected that period, but then said, because well, it's a relatively flat, flat file, we do have different data types within uh, the Ariadne data model. So these indicate that these are all artifact databases or image uh, collections. So these are collections which from the metadata all come from to that particular period. And again, I can drill down to particular uh, data sets. So this is nice Scandinavian brooches. It's be really excited and a data set um, deposited by Jane Kershaw, who did a PhD on, on Viking brooches, gave help by ODS. This is, is Periodo, it's fine, at the site. Uh, again, I'd, if you're not come across it, I would recommend it. And so we defined, well, each partner defined within an Ariadne uh, subset of Periodo their definitions of uh, uh, periods. Again, they're all published with URIs, so it's supporting the, the linked data concept. Uh, there's the uh, Ariadne data collection and definitions from our French colleagues in INRAP for how they use the term the tenth in their uh, reports that are online uh, with the start date and an end date that they applied. So to conclude from, from that, I hope I've given you quite a quick but a practical example of how, why data standards are uh, important and just some informal comments from me coming on from that we're relatively straightforward when a little bit harder but you don't have to agree on the period terms what is the is the tricky uh, one again the mappings are important and it's only as good as the individual data standards in different countries uh, that have supplied uh, data and the AAT doesn't cover everything we're now doing a lot more work on uh, artifacts at a level where we've got colleagues in the different in the Port of Antiquity scheme and other uh, national data sets that are starting to collect metal detected data having to work down much more granular vocabularies for specific types of, of brochures uh, that are being reported there so that we can enable some uh, transnational searches, say looking, if you're interested in the migration period, looking at brochures of a particular uh, period and how they're, they're, they're spreading and generating distribution maps from them. Um, so you need to plan for interoperability really at the start of a, of a project, not as, a, as an afterthought. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there, a lot of them on heritagedata.org, which is called by uh, FISH. Um, and you need to think about sustainability, and that's where the role of research infrastructures uh, comes in. Uh, my last slide then is to say what, what's happening next. We were pleased that the European Commission decided that uh, they wanted to continue supporting uh, Ariadne, so we're about to start early next year with the next phase, which we're following the same sort of approach but it's expanding Ariadne in a number of uh, directions. First of all, it's uh, expanding the thematic scope. We're bringing in a lot more 
uh, scientific uh, data <coughs> and scientific data uh, providers into Ariadne. We're expanding in two directions temporarily, bringing because a lot of uh, countries really supply what they see as a traditional uh, archaeology, sort of finishing in the Middle Ages. We're now moving much more into contemporary archaeology, buildings archaeology, uh, but also moving backwards into paleoanthropology. Uh, but we're also expanding the partnership. This was Ariadne uh, first phase. This is Ariadne plus with much better coverage in Southern Europe and Scandinavia and also Eastern Europe. Uh, so it's now 27 countries, but also extending beyond Europe. So we're working with uh, Digital Antiquity in the United States, uh, the NARA Research Institute in Japan, who have uh, got about at least 100,000 unpublished fieldwork reports on, online now, following the sort of UK model. Um, uh, and uh, Argentina through their research council, CONICET. So that's going to be kicking off uh, very soon. Uh, there's an open access article about the first phase of Ariadne published in, in Internet uh, Archaeology, if you want to know more about this. But we'll, I'm sure we'll report, be reporting back at Fuji CAAs, and there's a, going to be a big session um, with about 15 papers at uh, the CAA conference in, in Krakow, if you're able to attend that with contributions from all of our international partners on how Ariadne is taking things forward in their own countries. Thank you very much. <coughs>